Hello, and welcome to another Digital Differential Equations lecture video for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we are going to be going through Chapter 8.1 and looking at Laplace transforms. In Chapter 8, we investigate the Laplace transform a special type of linear transformation between two vector spaces. As a bypass strategy for changing linear differential equations into algebraic problems that can be easier to solve. In chapter 8.1 we give a visualization of the bypass strategy and then start to look at the Laplace transform of several types of functions. In chapter 8.2, we will then apply these concepts to solving some initial value problems. Now let's look at the bypass strategy first. The bypass strategy is a method for transforming a hard problem into an equivalent but more manageable one. This is not a new idea for us in mathematics. For example, consider the equation called quadratic in form from a recent college algebra class. It's not a quadratic because it's a technically a fourth degree polynomial, but it still has three terms like a quadratic. You may recall to rewrite this, you can introduce the substitution u is equal to x squared. Of course, if u is equal to x squared, then we could also say u squared would really be x squared squared, which would be x to the fourth. So replacing our terms in our polynomial, x to the fourth becomes u squared, x squared becomes u, and now we have an equation that looks more like a quadratic. Which you'll probably recognize is factorable and gives two factors. Now these are the two factors or the two roots to the quadratic, but we weren't solving the quadratic, we were actually solving this fourth degree polynomial. And so we can proceed by saying if u is equal to x squared, then x squared has to equal 2, and x squared has to equal 4, and this will then lead to four solutions in the variable x as root 2, negative root 2, 2, and negative 2. So this bypass strategy is something we've seen before. Now in our class, we will apply this concept to differential equations. Given a DE in x of t that we are unable to find a solution to, we will apply the Laplace transform, and notice the notation we use for the Laplace transform, it's kind of a fancy L, as a mapping from the t domain to an algebraic equation in the s domain. Now graphically, you can visualize it in this image. You're given a DE with initial conditions in your T domain, and you'd like to find a solution. However, direct solve, solving of this differential equation may not be possible because of some obstacle that's in your way. And it could be the obstacle that you just don't know how to find the solution to this particular differential equation. 
So what we'll do then is apply the bypass strategy. We'll apply the Laplace transform to our differential equation to rewrite it as an algebraic equation in your S domain. In your S domain, we'll be able to solve this algebraic equation to find our solution. We will then use the inverse Laplace transform to bring our solution back into the T domain that we're looking for. Now, we will look at actually solving some of these DEs in chapter 8.2. But for now, let's gain a familiarity for the Laplace transform by looking at some simple functions. And to start with, we'll introduce the integral definition of the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of some function f of t is defined on an interval from 0 to infinity is a function f of s given by this definite integral. It'll be the integral from 0 to infinity, so you'll recall this as an improper integral. Because of the use of the upper limit of infinity. Where the integrand is always e to the negative s of t times whatever your function is. Now notice since we'll be integrating with respect to t, when we're done, we will no longer have a value of t in our answer. It'll just be a function of our new variable s that's in the exponent of this exponential. Now if this limit exists, then we say f of t is a suitable function for the Laplace transform. Let us get some practice with the Laplace transform by looking at some simple functions. Consider the function f of t is equal to zero, the simplest function we can think of. If you were asked to find the Laplace transform of this function, you would write it as the Laplace of zero is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st. Now, it's always going to be times our function that's given. So times 0 dt. Of course, because one of the factors in your integrand is zero, the entire integrand is zero. And the integral of zero is zero. And so our first Laplace transform would be the Laplace of the zero function is zero. Now, some comments here. This should not be surprising to us. In general, we know that the linear transformation of zero or the zero vector is always zero. 
that is t of the zero vector is always the zero vector. And this would be one of those properties we recall from chapter five. Let's look at another example, a little bit more complicated function. Of course, f of t equals one is not terribly complicated, but it's the next more complicated function that I can think of. So now let's find the Laplace of one. So here we're going to write the Laplace of one is equal to the improper integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times one dt. Of course anything times one is itself, so I don't need the one there. But to evaluate this improper integral, we will rewrite it using limits. And so we'll have the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral zero to b e to the negative st dt. Now, while technically the integral of e to the negative st is a u substitution problem, I think because it's the integral of e, this is one that I can guess. And so I believe the antiderivative of e to the negative st is e to the negative st. But because of the negative st in your exponent, I think we need to account for this by multiplying by the fraction negative one over s as a coefficient. And if you're unsure about this, take the derivative to verify. The derivative of e to the negative st is e to the negative st times by the chain rule, the derivative of this exponent, which would be negative s, which would cancel this coefficient we added. And we're going to be evaluating this antiderivative on the interval zero to b. Now, of course, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us evaluate your antiderivative at the upper limit minus the lower limit. So when we evaluate the upper limit, you need to remember we're integrating with respect to t. So our limits go in for the t variable. So we'll have negative one over s e to the negative sb minus now our lower limit, which was negative one over s e. And when I plug in zero, we'll have zero as an exponent. Now in evaluating this limit, consider what happens as b goes to infinity to this exponential term. And recall that the graph of e to the negative sb, let's put a little sketch on the side here, the graph of e to the negative sb as b goes to infinity, that's our variable, is going to be a decreasing exponential function that asymptotically approaches the x-axis as time goes on. So it approaches the line y equals zero, which tells me that the limit of e to the negative sb, this is zero. And of course, simplifying by distributing our negative, recognizing e to the zero is always one. This gives us a limit that's just one over s. And this is now our second Laplace transform. 
the, the Laplace of the constant function 1 is 1 over s. Notice that we're now in the s domain since our variable that's present is s. Let's look at another example. Find the Laplace transform of f of t equals t. So Laplace transform of f of t equals t. And maybe I should give you a moment here to uh, work out the first couple of steps of your Laplace transform. So if you could pause your video right now, write your integral definition, and look at how to find the antiderivative of that. I'll see you back here in just a moment. Okay, I hope you paused your video and worked on this. Let's see how we did. To find the Laplace transform of f of t equals t, we'll write the Laplace transform of t is the improper integral 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times t dt. Of course we'll, we'll rewrite our improper integral as a limit. So the limit as b goes to infinity the integral 0 to b. And I want to rewrite our integrand by just changing the order of these two terms. This is not a required step, it just makes it feel more familiar to me. So I want to write it as t times e to the negative st dt. And now I would like to ask you to recall your integration techniques from Calc 2. How do we find the antiderivative of an integrand that looks like t e to the negative st? And I hope you're thinking integration by parts. Now recall with the integration by parts method, you will always pick a u portion of your integrand and a dv portion of your integrand. You'll then find the derivative of your u portion and the integral of your v portion. And there's usually only a couple guesses that we'll make, but here I'm going to jump right to letting u equal t and dv be e to the negative st dt. Now make sure you write the dt here because you'll have in general a differential has to equal a differential. Now the du, the derivative of dt is going to be just dt And the antiderivative of e to the negative st we saw in our last problem was negative 1 over s e to the negative st. And now you'll probably recall that to do integration by parts you always look at u times v minus the integral of v du. So applying this to our original limit, our original integral, this is now going to be the limit as b goes to infinity. And it's going to be u dv, so negative t over s e to the negative st minus the integral 
from 0 to B, a V du, so negative 1 over S, E to the negative ST dt. Let's simplify up our integrand a little bit. Um, just for stylistic choice, I'm going to bring this negative 1 over s factor in front of the integrand and write this now as negative t over s e to the negative st plus 1 over s integral 0 to b e to the negative st dt. And now we can look at finding the antiderivative of this portion of our integrand. And you'll recognize this has appeared already, the integral of e to the negative st. So we'll write this as the limit as b goes to infinity of negative t over s e to the negative st plus 1 over s and now the antiderivative of e to the negative st we'll know as negative 1 over s e to the negative st and this will all be evaluated now on the interval 0 to b I'd like to do one more step here of simplifying there our second factor. So I'll write limit as b goes to infinity, negative t over s e to the negative st. I think this is going to be minus 1 over s squared e to the negative st on the interval 0 to b still. Now the fundamental theorem of calculus of course still applies and we'll evaluate this limit by looking at your antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit now remember when we're evaluating at the upper limit, we're plugging in B for T. So we'll have negative B over S E to the negative SB minus 1 over S squared E to the negative SB minus, now we'll evaluate our antiderivative at 0, so plug in 0 in for t to get negative 0 over s e to the 0 minus 1 over s squared e to the 0. And there's lots of parts of this that we can simplify. And I'm going to jump right to the end because this is, you know, it's a little easier. Of course, you know, e to the 0 is just 1. And e to the 0 is 1. But this is 0 over something times 1. This whole factor, this whole term, is going to go to 0. Now we're looking at the limit as b goes to infinity. 
and look at this this portion here as b goes to infinity again this is a decreasing exponential function and so this goes to zero the part that you have to spend a little bit of time justifying is this factor or this term as b goes to infinity, technically this is going to look like negative infinity times e to the negative, oh, negative or e to the infinity. When we plug in infinity, you have e to the negative infinity here. And this ends up being negative infinity times zero. And so you'll recall this is referred to as an indeterminate form. And so if you're recalling from calculus, when you're presented with an indeterminate form, you must apply L'Hopital's rule to evaluate this limit. So recall for this, I'm going to write it on the side. Here we have the limit as b goes to infinity of negative b over s e to the negative sb and I'm thinking this is going to look like negative infinity times zero. So now recall with L'Hopital's rule what you'd like to do is rewrite this indeterminate product as an indeterminate quotient. And I'm going to do that by rewriting this so that the exponential part jumps into our denominator. So I'm going to write this as negative b over s e to the sb. Notice I've moved it to the denominator and got rid of our exponent, the negative exponent. And now we can see that as b goes to infinity, the top goes to negative infinity. And as b goes to infinity, e to the sb goes to infinity, and infinity times s is in still infinity. And now we have an indeterminate quotient. This is where we apply L'Hopital's rule. And remember, when applying L'Hopital's rule, you take a limit still of the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. So you take the derivative of the top is going to be just negative one and the derivative of the bottom is going to be s squared e to the sb. Now taking the limit as b goes to infinity the top is going to be negative 1, the bottom is going to be infinity, and notice that this approaches 0, which allows us to justify that this portion of our limit goes to 0. The only portion that remains is this last term at the end. Now recalling that if you do distribute this minus sign, then what we'll get as a limit is 1 over s squared. And this is our third Laplace transform. The Laplace of t is 1 over s squared. Notice how we move from a function in the t domain to a function in the s domain. Okay, let's try one more. Let's find the Laplace transform of f of t equals e to the t. So here I'll write this as the Laplace of e to the t, the improper integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times 
e to the t dt. And there's a couple things I'd like to do here. I want to rewrite my limit or my integrands or sorry, limits of integration using limits. So now we'll have the integral from 0 to b. And I'd also like to simplify the integrand. And notice that when you're multiplying these two exponentials that have a common base, we can add our exponents. And now what I would like to do is figure out a way to fig do this, this integral. And what makes this one a little easier is if you do some factoring. And what I'd like to do is do two factors here. I'd like to factor out a negative. Let me do some side work on the side so you can see it. Let's factor out a negative, which would leave st minus t. Notice if you distribute the negative back into the parentheses, you'd be at your original exponent. But then I'd also like to factor out a t, but I want to factor out a t, and I want to factor it out on the, on the right. And this is what I want my exponent to be. Okay, and now that we get the form of an exponential raised to an exponent, where the exponent has a coefficient in front of the t, I can now guess my antiderivative. And so we'll have the limit as b goes to infinity. Now the antiderivative. In general, the antiderivative of e to the anything is e to the anything. That doesn't change. But because of this coefficient in front of t, we need to account for that by having a factor of negative 1 over s minus 1 as a coefficient. And this beat would be evaluated on the interval from 0 to b still. Now, if this antiderivative looks a little odd, let's double check that it works by taking the derivative. The derivative of e to the anything is e to the anything times by the chain rule, the derivative of what's in your exponent, and the derivative of negative s minus 1 to the t, the negative and the s minus 1 would come down and cancel with our coefficient, and we'd be back at our original integrand. So I believe this does work. Now we'll use our fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate our antiderivative at the upper limit, so at our upper limit we would have, again, replacing the t with the b, our upper limit, we'd have negative 1 over s minus 1 times e to the negative s minus 1 times b. minus, now we'll evaluate at our lower limit, now we're sticking in the 0 for the t, so we'll have negative 1 over s minus 1, and when you plug in 0 for your exponent, the entire exponent becomes 0.
Now there's a lot going on here, but again, we're considering what happens as b goes to infinity. And as b goes to infinity, this exponential portion goes to zero, and so this entire term goes to zero. And of course, e to the zero is one, don't forget to distribute your double negative here. I think we get a limit that's just 1 over s minus 1. And this gives us our fourth int uh, Laplace transform now. The Laplace of e to the t is 1 over s minus 1. Okay, now you'll have a, 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 some more chances to practice these Laplace transforms using the integral definition in your homework. However, in general, we do not want to apply the Laplace transform using the integral definition every time. And so what I would like to present to you now is referred to as your Laplace transform tools. There are two tools I'd like you to feel familiar with. First is I'd like you to recognize that the Laplace transform is a linear transformation. And as it's a linear transformation, it preserves scalar multiplication. Meaning the Laplace of a constant times a function is the same thing as a constant times the Laplace of that function. And this is the property of linear transformations that you should recall from chapter 5. It also preserves vector addition, meaning the Laplace of the sum of two functions is going to be the sum of your Laplace transforms. And in general, the Laplace of any linear combination of functions is going to be a linear combination of the Laplace of each function individually. This allows us to break up complicated functions into the Laplaces of simple, simpler, smaller functions. You also have what we refer to as a table of known Laplace transformations. And the first couple you'll recognize are ones that we've already done. The Laplace of your constant function one is just one over s. The Laplace of t to the n. Now, we did t to the first power. So recognize that for t to the first power, the way you find your Laplace is going to be, well, whatever your exponent is, n, is going to be n factorial, so 1 factorial, over the over the fraction, the denominator s raised to the exponent n plus 1, where here our exponents are 1, so we get s squared, which is the same as 1 over s squared, which is agreeing with what we did. But this would be a general Laplace transform for t raised to any exponent. We also looked at the Laplace of, the Laplace of e to the t. Now, in general, it could be e to the a t. But notice for the one we did, the Laplace of e to the t, then in our example, a is equal to 1, and we got 1 over s minus 1. However, in general, it's going to be s minus a for whatever your coefficient or whatever your constant is in the exponent. Now, other Laplace transforms which we could look at would be if you're ever given the Laplace of a product of a power function times an exponential, or the Laplace of a trigonometric function. And notice how the Laplace of sine and cosine are very similar. They actually have the same denominator, but what's different is if it's a sine function, you only have b in your top in your numerator. Whereas it's a cosine function, you have s in your numerator. 
then there's Laplace's of products of exponentials times trig functions and Laplace's of hyperbolic trig functions. And for our class, I'm going to let you know that you can omit these. We are not going to be looking at the Laplace of, in, of hyperbolic trig functions. So these ones you can exclude from your study materials. Now, if you'd like to look in our textbook on page 472, there is a longer version. It's also in the in, on the back cover of your textbook. There's a longer version with more Laplace transforms. But I think this will be sufficient for us to get started. Now, I, I did include a brief sketch for what the proof of linearity would look like. Remember, our very first Laplace transform tool was the Laplace of a scalar multiplication of a function is the scalar multiplication of the Laplace, or vector addition, or you know the general Laplace transform of a linear combination of two functions. To show that this really is a linear transformation, I want to be able to verify that the right-hand side and the left-hand side are the same. And this is a this is a nice proof because it uses properties of calculus that we already know. So in general, if you're asked to find the Laplace transform of some linear combination of functions, then by using the integral definition, it would be the integral 0 to infinity e to the negative st times that linear combination of functions. However, you can simplify this by distributing your exponential to each of these two factors, or each of these two terms, excuse me. And then we can use some properties from calculus that says that the integral of the sum of two functions is really going to be the sum of two integrals. And notice by definition, this right here is the Laplace of f of t. Similarly, this second portion is by definition the Laplace of g of t. Which shows you how the Laplace transform uses properties of integrals to preserve scalar multiplication and vector addition. Now, what I would really like to do, though, is practice these Laplace transform tools, though. I would like to practice how I use the fact that the Laplace transform preserves these operations and how to use this table of known Laplace transforms to evaluate some uh, some examples. So let's look at the first one. Here I would find, like to find the Laplace transform of this function. Now first, using the fact that the Laplace transform is a linear transformation that preserves vector addition, we can write this as the Laplace of 3 plus the Laplace of 2t plus the Laplace of negative e to the negative 2t. Now, using the fact that the Laplace transform preserves scalar multiplication, we can write this as 3 times the Laplace of 1 plus 2 times the Laplace of t minus the Laplace of e to the negative 2t. Now, a couple of these we've done our, on our own. We've looked at the Laplace of 1. Remember, the Laplace of 1 is 1 over s. So this will look like 3 times 
1 over s. plus 2 times, now we've looked at the Laplace of t, and so recall that the Laplace of t is 1 over s squared minus the Laplace of e to the negative 2t. Now we didn't do e to the negative 2t, we did e to the t, so let's look back at our Laplace table. And it says the Laplace of e to any exponential, grab your constant a, is 1 over s minus a. 1 over s minus a. So ours is going to be 1 over s minus a. But a is negative 2, so s minus a is going to be s plus 2. And of course our author will simplify this as 3 over s plus 2 over s squared minus 1 over s plus 2. And this is the Laplace of our given function. Again, notice how it takes us from a function in your s domain, sorry, a function in your t domain, and gives us a function in our s domain. Now, I think when some students apply this concept, there are lots of steps that you can skip here to get to the final answer. And I'm totally fine with you skipping steps to get there. Let's look at another example. Let's find the Laplace of 3t plus 2t cubed. And depending on which steps you decide to skip, uh, you may write something different than me, but I'm going to spell out every point or every every step here that I can. Using the fact that the Laplace transform preserves vector addition, we can write this as the sum of two Laplaces. Using the fact that the Laplace transform preserves vector, our scalar multiplication, we can bring the scalars as coefficients. And now we can find the Laplace of each of these functions. So remember the Laplace of t, that's one that we, we did as a group as 1 over s. Plus 2 times the Laplace of t cubed. Now we didn't do t cubed, so let's look back. So t cubed in general is a power function. And so it says the Laplace of t to the n is always going to be n factorial. So ours is t cubed, so 3 factorial over s raised to the 3 plus 1, so s to the 4th. So I think we should get... three factorial over s to the fourth power. And I can simplify this as three over s. Now recall when I say three factorial, that three factorial is really three times two times one. So this would be six don't forget the other factor of 2 that's in front. So I think this is going to be plus 12 over s to the fourth. And that's our Laplace transform. We're now in the s domain. 
Okay. Maybe I can give you a moment to try this next one on your own. So if you could pause your video and then look at the little plus transform of this combination of functions. I'll see you in a moment. Okay, I hope you paused your video and looked at the Laplace of this combination. And again, you can show however many steps you'd like here, but if I'm showing all my steps, I can write this as the Laplace of t e to the negative t plus the Laplace of sine of 3t. Now t e to the negative t, this is the product of two functions. We haven't looked at a product yet. So let's look back at our Laplace table. And notice this resembles number four, Laplace of t to the n, e to the a t. And notice the role of n and a. The n goes in the top as a factorial n factorial. The bottom, s minus a, so whatever your exponent is on that exponential term, raised to the n plus 1, where the n is on that power term. So it's n factorial over s plus s minus a to the n plus 1. So if we scroll back, I think this is going to look like the fraction. It's going to be 1 factorial over s, now it's s minus a, but here your coefficient on your exponent is negative 1, so s plus 1 to the n plus 1, so I think it would be squared, plus, now we'll do the little plus of sine of 3t, so let's back out our table again. The Laplace of a sine function is going to be whatever your argument is, b, as your numerator, over f squared plus b squared. Where here, our b was a 3. So it would be 3 and then 3 squared in your denominator. So I think we can write this as... 3 over s squared plus 9. Now I don't want to leave that factorial there, so I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over s plus 1 squared plus 3 over s squared plus 9. And this is your Laplace transform. It takes your function in the t domain to a function in your s domain. Okay, I have two more examples for you. And I'd like to give you a moment to uh, rewrite both of these using your table of Laplace transforms and the linearity of the Laplace transform. So if you could, pause your video and look at these two Laplace transforms. I'll, I'll see you in a moment. Okay, I hope you paused your video. Uh, let's see how we did. So here we want to find the Laplace transform of the sum of two functions. I'm going to write this as the Laplace of t cubed e to the 3t plus the Laplace of the cosine of 2t. Now, using your table of Laplace transform, the Laplace of t cubed e to the 3t should look like 3 factorial, and that comes from this t cubed over s minus 3, and that s minus 3 comes from the e to the 3t, raised to the fourth power, plus, 
Now the Laplace of cosine of 2t is going to be s over s squared plus 4. Of course 3 factorial we'll know as 3 times 2 times 1. So 6 over s minus 3 to the fourth plus s over s squared plus 4. This is your Laplace transform. Okay, let's try one more. The Laplace of e to the negative t cosine 2t plus e to the negative t sine of 2 2t. Two so e to the negative t cosine 2t plus the Laplace of e to the negative t sine of 2t. Now, now we have the product of an exponential time a times a trigonometric. So if you look back at your Laplace table, I'm going to be using here forms 7 and 8, where you have the Laplace of an exponential times a sine or an exponential times a cosine. And notice the form. If it's a sine function, you have a b in the numerator. Where if it's a cosine function, you have an s minus a. Other than that, these two forms look the same. So if we apply that, then we'll have s plus 1 over s plus 1 squared plus the square of b gives you 4 and the plus of e to the negative t sine of 2t is going to be 2 over s plus 1 squared plus 4 and this is your Laplace transform. Okay, let's add a little bit more theory that might help us with some of our Laplace transforms. And the next piece of theory I'd like to give you is referred to as the exponential shift property. This says if you're given the Laplace of a product of an exponential and some other function, so any other function f of t times an exponential, the exponential shift property says ignore the exponential factor and just find the Laplace of f of t. This will give you your function in the s domain then shift that Laplace by a factor of a. So find the Laplace of f of t, ignoring the exponential part, and then shift it by whatever your exponent is on the exponential. So let me show you this with an example. Let's find the Laplace of e to the 2t cosine of 2t. Here I'm going to start with just the Laplace of the cosine of 2t. Now using our table of Laplace transforms, the Laplace transform of cosine of 2t is going to be s over s squared plus 4. Now apply 
the shift. So now if this is f of s, now I want to look at f of s minus a, which means place all your replace all your s's with your s minus a, where here your a is this 2. So it'll look like now s minus 2 over s minus 2 squared plus 4. This is our Laplace transform. Notice that the exponential shift property will agree with and maybe does shorten your requirements or shorten your necessity to use our table. Because technically the plus we just did was the plus transform number eight. It was an exponential times a trigonometric. And what we got as an answer agrees with our table. It just adds a little bit more uh, of, uh, of a tool to be able to rewrite your functions. So you don't always have to use this table if you know the exponential shift property. Okay, let's try another one. Let's find the Laplace of e to the negative t times t squared. So here we're going to start with just the Laplace of t squared. Now the Laplace of t squared is going to look like 2 factorial over s cubed. Of course 2 factorial is just 2, so it's 2 over s cubed. This is f of s. Now apply the shift and look at f of s minus a. So here the a is the negative 1. So if it's s minus a, your s minus the negative 1, this is going to end up looking like 2 over s plus 1 cubed. And now this is your Laplace transform. And now this is where I'd like to give you some words of encouragement. If finding these Laplace transforms feels obscure to you still, then I encourage you to do as many problems in your book as you can. The more of these you do, the more familiar you start to recognize some of these Laplaces. Like jumping from t squared to 2 factorial over s cubed. Or similarly jumping from the Laplace of cosine, cosine of 2t just to this fraction. The more of these you do, the more familiar this will come to you. And if you did enough of these, I don't know, did every single one in your book, you'd be able to find the Laplace transforms like you find the derivatives or integrals of simple functions in calculus. You will get good at it. Okay, I have a little bit more to talk about still. We still need to talk about the inverse Laplace transform. However, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop our video here and make a new video for describing your inverse Laplace transform. I hope this video is helpful and I'll see you in our next one.